you know, now that he's actually you know back in the White House, I, I think it's even less of a real issue. Uh, it, honestly, when you you hear people talking about enemies taking advantage of us, it's it it sounds more like they've been watching designated survivor too long then they're actually looking at the the practicalities of of kind of where we are in geopolitics first of all if you go around the world and look at the adversaries um the, the, the russia really has no cards to play i mean look even at in belarus where which is in their sphere of influence and and something that to be deeply concerned about where they've where they've ger- very gingerly dealt with things because the they just don't really have the capacity to, to do risky things right now. Iran is, is nearly bankrupt. They're on the defensive almost everywhere. Um, they're very risk-averse. They're, they're just waiting out the election, hoping that the other guy wins. Uh, North Korea has been quiet. They show no signs of not being quiet. I think they're also waiting out the results of the election. But the Chinese have a lot of cards to play, but you would think, well, how would the Chinese actually operationalize this and take advantage of it? And, and for what end or what purpose? And, and it's not really, really clear at all. Um, particularly if, if the Chinese really did want the president to lose, then doing something might actually improve his chances of winning. And so it, from, from an adversary perspective, and, they, and of course, they have to think this thing up in 24 hours, because none of us knew the president had uh, was ill, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden he was ill, and then all of a sudden he was healthy again. And so the notion that they were going to throw something together that quickly it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So when you start to think through the practicalities the, from an adversarial perspective, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then when you start to think about it from our perspective, uh, and you realize how, and, and, and adversaries know this, how really incredibly resilient our, both our legal structure are in terms of succession of command and our physical ability to, to do command and control of, of the U.S. military, of our diplomacy, of our economy, virtually of everything. Um, you know, it was pretty robust before, um, but post 9 11, we have the governments put so much effort into what's called continuity of government, ensuring that all that is in place. Uh, it's incredibly robust. I would actually argue that in, 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 in terms of technology, in terms of structures and processes, that our command and control is probably more resilient now than it was during the, the, the Cold War when we worried about having the command and control in the middle of a nuclear crisis. You brought up China, and I wanted to ask you about how the Chinese might use what's happened over the past week in a larger information battle against the United States. We saw this week a report in the New York Times indicating there was some new Chinese propaganda out that showed a fake strike on U.S. soil and basically some words attached to a video threatening the United States. And we're seeing this amid tension regarding trade, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, and also uh, accusations about the origins of COVID-19 and calls for accountability when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. Do you feel they'll try to use this outbreak of coronavirus around the president's circle against him? Sure. But the the question is, is how much does it matter? I mean, there's a couple of issues there. One is, sure, the Chinese and the Russians and others can can try to do propaganda against the United States, kind of overt actions. And, we, and we've seen some of this. We've seen some, for example, in both the Russian and the Chinese press, you know, kind of ridiculing the president or trying to make fun of the president. Um, the question is, is from, from an overt propaganda perspective, do they understand us any better than we understand ourselves? Remember, these are actually foreign actors trying to interpret how to influence American behavior. And... Our our own perceptions of how to influence our behavior is difficult. When foreign adversaries try to do that, it often comes off as as clumsy and and immature. And and in many ways, it might have the unintended consequences of of producing the exact opposite effect they're trying to achieve. So, for example, when the Chinese ridicule President Trump, does does that make him stronger or weaker? Um, I mean, you can make an argument that the Chinese... Ridiculing him actually would, would make people more inclined to vote for him because they're concerned about the Chinese. So, propaganda is is a it's 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 a particularly over a short term 
uh, trying to have a fa- very risky and 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 really unlikely. And then of course there's you know disinformation. Can they spread? Yeah, they can, and and they do. And and um, and the Russians are actually much more aggressive at this. But the problem with disinformation is 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 it really having any impact? I mean, this is the side of that we never talk about. We always talk about Russian interference and Chinese interference, and and we see very little data about what. Well, is it actually making any difference? You know, we're in such a, uh, a a tense, partisan, loud information environment inside the United States. That makes it very, very difficult for, for disinformation to really kind of bust through. I mean, it's not like a guy yelling fire in a movie theater because everybody in the movie theater is quiet because they're watching the movie. It's, it's like a guy yelling fire at the Super Bowl with 80,000 fans screaming in the stands. So, sure, maybe they're trying to influence us, but so many people are trying to influence Americans and voters. I just think it kind of gets lost in the sauce. Uh, That's an interesting way to put it, yelling fire at the Super Bowl, because you're right, there is so much information, and it's this flood of information. I think voters have difficulty sort of sifting through it. That paired with uh, distrust overall, when it comes to these conversations that are often so partisan, it makes it really difficult, especially less than 30 days out from an election. How do you feel this all plays into the election that's less than a month away? You know, the president coming out at the White House when he returns from uh, Walter Reed Medical Center and basically making a small address to the American people to say, hey, look, uh, he believes that he has gotten through the worst part of this virus and he's going to head back out on the campaign trail when he's better, and uh, we'll likely see a couple more debates if things go as scheduled. But how does this all play into the minds of voters? Uh, You brought up an interesting point about short-term propaganda and how it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to influence the outcome of anything. I mean, over the weekend, this was an obsessive topic that just consumed everything. Can, can you name for me what last week's crisis du jour was? And I think a lot of people will like, well, no. And my guess is next week, people will forget about this week. I mean, it, part of this, of course, is, is um, the way pundits and media and critics have operated, particularly with this president, which is to just leap on everything like this is the, the Armageddon. Uh, and... And then, of course, when it turns out to be not an Armageddon, then they just jump onto the next, you know, bright, shiny object. Well, part of the problem with doing that is you've kind of conditioned the American people that, oh, yeah, here we go again, you know, another Trump crisis, you know, whether they like him or dislike him. And then and then they said, yeah, it'll be gone by Monday. And then it's gone by Monday. And, of course, we're on to the next crisis. So I, I think in many ways, you know, they've desensitized desensitize people to the kind of Trump crisis mode, because we can't be in crisis mode our entire lives. It doesn't work that way. You know, we've got to go to the supermarket. You know, we've got to pick up Halloween costumes at Walmart. But we don't have time for this. I mean, we're, we're, we're dealing with COVID and we're dealing with our jobs. So I, I, I wonder, and this isn't a partisan comment, this is kind of really kind of me more as a historian looking at how you know, populations deal with news and and information and consume it. You know, part of me wonders if there's anybody left you know that hasn't made up their minds. I mean, normally we say uh, people don't really focus on national elections until they come back from Labor Day, and then they you know kind of think about it in October and get really serious about it at the end of the month. I I I don't you know we've had this kind of very angry aggressive politics. Since the end of the 2016 election, we've never kind of left that mode. And I just wonder how many people are out there left to be convinced. And if any of this, whether it is, you know, a scandal from one side or the scandal from the other side, really moves anything. I mean, I think it's very interesting, for example, that if if you just look at it from the look at it from the president's perspective, I mean, his popularity numbers have have been relatively stable um, and they've actually climbed up, uh, even as we've gotten closer to the election. And, and it seems not related at all to the, you know, the news du jour. 